bop. And they bop because they know Unix, and they feel very powerful. <laughs> so those of you, woo, those of you, raise your hand if you're a Unix person, you know Unix, and you know to, am I right or am I right? Do you have a bop? Isn't it great? You kind of walk around, you know what to do. It's amazing. I once, just for fun, decided to um, have a, there was a hole in the south side of Soda. That was the building that's being built, that's already built now, the Citrus building. And I said, I would love to get a camera and control it from a computer and have it take a picture and then squash it down, put it on a website, take another picture, and then put that behind that so when you move your mouse over it, it showed you the two pictures you had, like kind of a A, B, A, B of the two pictures. And then every day, collect all of them, put the right name, and then put that all together in one big movie and make a time-lapse movie of this building in high definition because I have a camera and the camera's high def digital SLR. I sat down for a week using Unix and all the small utilities and I got this to work. And it was awesome. And for four years, my Unix script worked. I would crash once in a while when things crashed and the camera broke and all that stuff. But I basically captured one million photographs from that project and I have them on the line. You can actually go online and watch my movie now if you wanted to. That's awesome. All that was based on the power of Unix. I also wanted to one day test my mail and I wanted to see how much mail I had not answered. So I went in there and I wrote a script to go and look at my inbox and see what the size of my inbox was and also see what the unread messages in my inbox were and take those two numbers and graph them and I have a graph on my webpage of these two numbers over the course of, by the way, I looked at the numbers, made a little file, added to it, concatenated into a directory of the, like that date into the special place and then at the end of every day I would make an add to a graph. You can run GNU plot which is this cool um, freeware uh, graphing program and I added a little dot on a plot and I made a little jaggedy line. And I did this automatically, I just went back and then I went for a trip and I came back a week later and the cool thing was I could check on my phone what my mail status was. I could look at my phone which had a little bit of a, you know, a web browser and I could look at my phone, oh look at that, look at my mail. And I could see all the graphs and one day I, did, I went away and I didn't check it for a week and I saw the numbers just go because I wasn't answering my email, it was awesome. And so I could use my phone, it was really cool. All that stuff is just all Unix, and you can do a million things with Unix. You can't, and whatever you want to imagine, Unix is your way for you. So everybody takes 90. Okay. <laughs> 9F, C++. So C++ is the next version uh, in which there was a huge movement in the, you know, in the developers community that people are realizing how powerful the object-oriented paradigm of programming is. Does anybody know what the other three paradigms are? Functional, like what? Can you think of a language on the list that's functional? Scheme. So that's right. Scheme is a functional language, which you just think of the world as these little, these little pipes that have many inputs, or maybe none, and one output. Okay? Or maybe they don't, and maybe they do something. And that's it. And the whole job is just plugging these little, little light bulb things together. Two to one, three to one, ten to one. That's all it is. That's all functional programming is, is plugging these things together nicely. So that's functional is two. What's another, what's three and four for in terms of the, the programming paradigms? Is C, is C either object-oriented or functional? Function. It's neither. It's a third one. Anybody know what that is called? Structure. Say it again. Structured. structured, not close. Close. Sequential or imperative or procedural. Those are the three things I've, I've often heard. So C basically says, do this, do this, do this, do this. Like, you know, A equals A plus one. B equals A times seven. All those things are kind of do this or this. That's the sequential nature or imperative nature of that. There's a fourth that people don't mention. Do you know what the fourth one is? If you didn't know what the third one was, probably know what the fourth one is. Fourth one, is. anybody ever heard of prologue before? Logic. Logic or declarative programming. That's where you kind of just basically say some facts around the world and you ask it to prove <laughs> things about it. So I know there's a blank seat there and every person with long hair has a person with short hair to the right like a logic puzzle and I can ask, does the system have any person with long hair sitting next to another person with long hair? And, and you can ask questions and the thing will just solve it by asking, putting rules in the system. It's pretty cool. It's very powerful, actually. If you take CS61A, we'll teach you all four using scheme. We know in 61A how to change the semantics, the meaning of a language by changing the interpreter. So you can actually write an interpreter to have the same scheme thing mean four different things. And we can actually, we actually make you do that. It's really wonderful. So that's cool stuff. 620 is powerful. Your brain will explode. All right. <laughs> C++. People realize they want, to, they want to move to object orientation. So how do you make all this world of C programmers learn this OOP stuff? They have to make everybody throw their old code away and get this whole OOP thing from scratch? Well, no. What you typically do is you add on to that. You have something that kind of adds on to C that adds the object-oriented feature to it. Well, 
it's kind of a joke with the name, not a joke like, like, uh, like a mockery, but a joke kind of funny, haha, because plus plus is the operator that takes it a value i, if i had the value 10, if I say i plus plus, i, that really means i equals i plus 1, so i is now 11. So get it? If you take c and add 1 to it, you kind of get the next oopy. <laughs> that kills them at the programming conventions. Right? This is very, very funny. Very, very funny. Uh, so then, and that was, you know, that's like late 80s, I'm going to guess, something like that, late 80s-ish. Turns out that the advanced placement exam moved to C++ for a short little window of time, which is a big deal. To switch everybody, to retrain all the high school teachers into using a new language, that's a big deal, C++. And then right around the corner is the funny one, comes Java. And Java says, wait, forget that. What if we started from scratch, right? What if we didn't do what the C folks, C++ folks did, which is to layer this thing onto that? But I actually said, start from scratch, take the things we know, the best things about languages, and, and, and keep those and the worst things about them, like all the C details, and throw those away, like memory management, thrown away. Like dangly references, thrown away. All that stuff, right? Throw that away, make it really clean. Add more libraries so that's really, people have to keep reinventing the wheel every time. Ah, Sun Microsystems. Uh, James. Gosling invents Java. So what we have is that came in around, you know, the 90s, some of, some of the 90s. And that was so good in terms of like auto documentation, all the features I mentioned before, it swept away C++. So like everyone had to retrain in C++ and then two years later, it's now Java. Okay, you're kidding me. Nope, they're serious. And they whole went to Java. And we've, been the, we've been Java since. So Java is now the language to stay for now. We'll see what happens. We'll see whether Python can take it over. A lot of languages have come up since Java days, and Perl is one, and Ruby is another one, and a lot of you know smaller Erlang and some other things. Python came around, and Python seemed to take the best of all worlds. Python is like the chameleon language. It's really small, really cute, in the sense that you can be in an interpreter, and your first Python program could be the number one. You type the number one, hit enter, that's a valid Python program. Java, you need you know like five lines to make the first program the hello world. Your first hello world is hello world is a string. You're done. Put quotes around it. That's your first program. It's pretty cool. So because it had an interpreter, we like that. Um, it has the ability to pretend like it's a functional language. So you can just deal with functions and you don't have to have any side effects. It's just exactly like scheme in that sense. It's just, it's a sequential language, just like C. You can do statements and affect state. And it has object oriented stuff in it. Although not as much overhead as Java had with all the special keywords, private, public, protected. You just have these things and if you get a class, you can poke into it and we basically trust you with it. So that's kind of cool. So rather than have to force the programmer to kind of declare all this stuff and have these rigid walls, let's have soft walls. Programs are pretty much good by anyway, so it's going to work. It's a simpler language. If you look at pseudocode and also the, the quirk about Python, indentation has semantic meaning. So if you would actually write, you know, a, a piece of Python, if you want to write a pseudocode, we, we in computer science think about pseudocode where I said, Give me an algorithm. Give me a, pro a procedure for doing something. Oh, okay. Take some slices of bread, and then for every slice of bread in the loaf, do this. And you say, do this. What do you mean? Do five things? Yeah, do the five. Well, you probably would indent the way you do these five things, right? Do one, two, three, four, like an indentation, or like HTML has its indentation for lists and other kind of thing. You'd probably indent it on the board, right? That has meaning in the Python program. So you actually read Python it's as if you're reading English on the board. It's actually really cool. So all of us, many of us, think Python is the future. We love it. We really, it's a little slower. It's slower than C. It's never gonna, nobody's gonna ever touch C. But it's really great. It's my current favorite language. I know, you know, 10 languages or so. I love this. It's my favorite language to play with. So, long story short, that's what we offer. Yay! Okay. So, they're all one unit courses. They're all pass, not pass. So, they're pretty cool. What that means probably for you is that if you take these CS9 series, you're probably not gonna prioritize the course. Because look, come on. A four unit graded course versus a one unit pass not pass course, even if you get a not pass, it doesn't affect your GPA. That's true. It's, it still shows on a transcript, not pass, but your GPA stays at 4.0. Because pass not because a pass wouldn't raise your GPA, so a not pass shouldn't lower your GPA. That makes sense, right? So I want to encourage you, I'm going to show you the failure rates a little later. And I'm going to encourage you to think seriously about this CS9 series if you actually decide to go there. We have a third category of courses we offer the self-paced program called the CS47 or Bridge Series. CS47A, oh, I didn't go back through numbers. 9A, MATLAB, hands raised, people who are excited about MATLAB. Yay, MATLAB. Two, 9B, Pascal, Woohoo! nobody. 9C, not after what you said, Dan. 9C, okay. 9D, Scheme, let's get some love in there. One or two. 9E, Unix, 
I'll, I'll wait until everybody hands up. No, okay. Uh, 9F, C++. 